great pleasure to welcome you to what I think is uh, maybe the first uh, no. in-person Create Seminar called Cult. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Just start. Well, no, just started my sixth. Did you really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Justin back. <laughs> uh, so thank you m so much, Melanie, for that wonderful introduction. It is fantastic to be back. This space did not exist when I was visiting the Create for STEM Institute uh, back in 2017 before I left. This was just a maze of dark hallways and so uh, I'm also happy to be back because the presentation I'm going to give today uh, has some of the stuff I did as a postdoc here at Michigan State but it also includes how I've extended that uh, into my own independent research career and still collaborate with Melanie and colleagues uh, and uh, Melanie inspired my love of laboratory learning and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, which is the characterization and evaluation of engagement uh, in scientific practices in the chemistry laboratory. <laughs> as my clicker will not work. Hang on. Technical difficulties. All right. So if we're going to talk about learning in the laboratory, we need to take a brief history lesson uh, and go back 40 years. Uh, 40 years ago this year, uh, Hofstein and Lunetta released their seminal paper uh, uh, regarding learning in the laboratory. And what they found was that more research needed to be done on the effects of laboratory learning. Chemistry labs in particular are dangerous. They are resource intensive, both in terms of money and in terms of materials. There's hazardous waste disposal. There's lots of things that need to uh, come into play there. And we don't know really why we have students take them. But in, the, in this room of scientists, if I said teach science without lab, you'd probably all clutch your pearls and say, I, I can't do it. Right? But we need to start uh, thinking about why we have students take lab and what students are getting out of it. If we fast forward to the turn of the millennium into the year 2000, um, there was an update to the Hofstein and Lunetta paper. They updated their own paper uh, and still said uh, that there, we needed more evidence that there is that we need laboratory uh, laboratories and what students are getting from it. But what they did have uh, is that they said that there was little evidence that traditional cookbook labs did anything to reinforce science understanding and recall. So engaging in students in the following of directions, mix A with B, add B to C, and here's why you're doing it, does nothing to deepen their science understanding, which is unfortunate, because that's really why they should be taking lab. And if we fast forward another 12 years to 2012, uh, with the release of the Discipline-Based Education Research Report from the National Research Council, still 30 years after the publication of the initial Hofstein and Lunetta paper, we still 
have yet to provide a ton of outcomes as to why students are taking lab and what they're getting out of labs. Um, also in that DEBA report, there still is this, there is a call for a change in our gateway courses. And so a lot of the work that I was involved in here as a postdoc at Michigan State was in the transformation of gateway courses, both through the three-dimensional learning project, which was first funded by HHMI and now NSF IUs, but also part of the HHMI grant was the transformation of the general chemistry labs here at MSU uh, back when I was a postdoc. And still, 10 years after this, uh, we're still working on that evidence. So this makes, marks the 40th anniversary of the Hofstein and Lynetta paper. And we haven't done a ton in order to get that help the research effect, uh, of the effects of laboratory learning. Uh, all right, so what is the purpose of lab? Um, some folks, now my clicker won't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some folks uh, say that, I can't get anything to work, there. So some folks say that the purpose of lab is to reinforce that chemistry content, even though this flies in the face of the reports that you know traditional labs do nothing to reinforce science recall. Um, others feel that it's to teach students laboratory techniques and get them to build those hands-on skills and the dexterity that chemists need to be to do to perform things like titrations or pipetting, and they need to use, uh, learn those techniques. Uh, but others feel that it's for, to build the problem-solving skills and those troubleshooting skills, because as scientists, we all know that experiments don't work right the first time or sometimes the second or third or fourth time. And it's ex that experimentation and troubleshooting, uh, which seems to be the hallmark of many a graduate program and many an experiment in science in the sciences. Um, but the students need to learn how to do this in, in a constructed and a safe environment so that they're not going to cause harm. And to me, what all of this boils down to is that we really need labs to teach students how to act and behave like a scientist in these real contexts. And so to look how to do that, um, I've grounded our work in the framework for K-12 science education. And if you've probably seen some of these slides before from our 3DL for Us project, um, the framework lays out uh, a theory for learning called three-dimensional learning uh, that focuses on what we call the scientific practices, which are the things that students do, cross-cutting concepts, as well as the core ideas or what they're thinking about. Uh, and so the goal here is to intimately intertwine these three aspects into what is known as three-dimensional learning. Again, the practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the core ideas. Or the way I like to think about this is the core ideas are what we want students to know. So this is their chemistry content, biology content, organic chemistry content, what have you. The scientific practices are what we want students to do with that knowledge or how we want to them to demonstrate their understanding. And the cross-cutting concepts are lenses that they can use to think about that knowledge across the different science disciplines. So how can we think about um, a particular scenario in, in chemistry and biology and physics, uh, things like structure, functional, structure, function, or structure property relationships, things that cross a, a cut across uh, the science and engineering disciplines. Being that I do a lot of work in the labs, my bread and butter is the scientific and engineering practices because this is what we're asking students to do. And we've got a lot of physical uh, space to do these experiments. And so I've focused on the scientific and engineering practices, which are the multiple ways of knowing and doing and understanding that scientists and engineers use to understand the world around us. And so if you look at this list as a scientist, you can probably recall many times a day in which you engage in these practices, analyzing and interpreting data. Do I need a jacket? I'm from Florida. I'm a little cold right now, but I think it's beautiful outside. Um, do, so do I need a jacket to go outside, yes or no? That is analyzing and interpreting data, even if it's not in an exactly scientific context. Um, the nice thing about uh, the three the uh, scientific practices is while I was a postdoc here at MSU, uh, myself and the 3DL team published what we called the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol, or the lovingly the 3D LAP for short. Um, and what this gives us is it gives us a very very specific criteria by which we can evaluate, use to evaluate assessments to understand whether the assessment question has the opportunity for the student to engage in the practices or the cross-cutting concepts and the core ideas. And so, in essence, this asks three questions of an assessment qu task. Is there a scientific practice? If so, which one? Is there a cross-cutting concept? If so, which one? And is there a core idea? If so, which one? And again, being that I do a lot of work in the lab, 
I don't focus as much on these two, but what we found in the 3DL for us project is that the, the scientific practices are really the linchpin to engage with three-dimensional learning. And so if we're giving students opportunities to engage in practices in the lab, we're setting them up, uh, we're helping them, helping set them up for three-dimensional learning. And so again, it's a very explicit criteria that was developed for assessment tasks in the beginning. And so for example, the criteria for argumentation say that a, uh, an assessment question should give an event, observation, or phenomenon. Then it should ask students to make a claim about that phenomenon that is based on that given event or phenomenon. Give the evidence that provides the support for that, that claim and then link with causal reasoning, right? So this is where students are using causal mechanistic reasoning in order to say, why does this evidence support that claim? And in my students, in my classroom, I always say, this is where you get to flex your chemistry muscles. This is where the chemistry, that linking of ideas together comes into play. And this is where what, my students, what I say to my students is the chemical heavy lifting. Um, and so the, the curriculum that I have uh, bought into uh, mentally and philosophically uh, is a different curriculum uh, published by none other than Melanie Cooper. Um, it's called Cooperative Chemistry um, and this uh, curriculum is a laboratory curriculum that gives students opportunities to have multi engage in multi-week group projects. So it's not just a one and done experiment where students are following directions. Uh, students are actually designing their own procedures. So they're being able to come up with their own questions design their own procedures, and then get to carry them out in a controlled, uh, cha somewhat chaotic environment. Um, and the nice thing about this curriculum is that we, there's a number of sources uh, and a number of papers that have been published since that show that engaging in these project-based laboratories or this cooperative chemistry curriculum has shown an improvement in students' metacognition and problem solving. They're getting the opportunity to troubleshoot when their original procedure does not work, and they're encouraged to, to try things out. And so for this reason, uh, I've been moving forward and trying to take over my university's chemistry labs uh, and get as many any project-based experiments in there as possible. And so what is a project-based experiment? Uh, near the end of my postdoc, I was able to work with Melanie and uh, our former general chemistry lab director, Joe Ward, um, to develop a project-based lab that uses the chemistry of commercial glow sticks in order to engage students in the scientific practices. Um, and so we published this back in 2017, and it actually made the cover of the Journal of Chemical Education. A big shout out to my fiance, TJ, who actually photoshopped these two pictures together for me. Uh, and helped us to get on the cover. And so what we've done is we've used the, we've used the three dimensional learning assessment protocol or the 3D lab and some uh, additional criteria in order to start understanding, looking at the laboratory manual itself or what we ask students to do to see what, pro uh, what practices students have the opportunity to engage in. So for example, the laboratory activity asks, tells them that they work for a glow stick company uh, and a customer has asked for two specific types of glow sticks. And so this little excerpt here meets all of the criteria for designing solutions, which is more of an engineering practice, but we've given our students the opportunity to, do, to engage with it. They're also asked to write a preliminary plan that includes everything your team has to do to carry out. And remember that everybody should be doing chemistry. This is a hallmark. Everybody should be doing something. It's how we can leverage uh, in this exploration because with one student following directions, you might get three hours of work, but with four students working collaborati collaboratively, you get four times three hours of work. So you get 12 actual working hours. So you can do a lot more with these group projects. And so this, is, this meets the criteria criteria for planning and carrying out investigations. And then they do, their, they do their investigation, they make glow sticks and little cuvettes and measure the fluorescent intensity that comes off of it. Uh, and then they're asked to analyze and interpret that data. So what is the reason for, ask, for having different dye solutions? Uh, we're asking them to think about what the data that they've received from this spectrometer and what it means in the scenario that they're given. And then they're asked to make a claim, to provide a claim and evidence and reasoning um, for the effect of temperature on this particular system. Now I'll say when I did this here at Michigan State, we did this in the first semester. They had not learned about kinetics yet, but this could be extended. You could do much more, um, a much more of a deep dive in terms of actual chemical kinetics, but right now we're just asking uh, for the effect of temperature. Does it go faster? Does it go slower? 
And so you can see how one laboratory experiment can actually, or laboratory project, can in engage students in particular practices. So the, the grayed out ones here are the ones that students have the potential to engage in by doing this multi-week project. So that's great, this is one experiment. And so I started to look at the entire first semester, at least when I was here, um, the entire first semester of a, a project-based curriculum. And so the dark blue shaded are the ones that students have the opportunity to engage in as, as evidenced in the laboratory manual. And we can compare something that looks like this to a more traditional uh, cookbook-based <laughs> Uh, laboratory curriculum. And again, this is looking just at the, solely at the laboratory manuals and at looking at what students were explicitly asked to do. Um, and so you can see here that there's a very stark difference between what students are asked to do in a project-based laboratory curriculum and what students are typically asked to do uh, in a more traditional, pro uh, traditional cookbook experiment or what students are not asked to do um, in this case. And so uh, the way I've carried this forward into my independent career, I don't know why it brought them all up, um, is my uh, master's student, at VR, has actually started to do, use the 3D lab and its modifications to code or to characterize more laboratory experiences. Uh, so we collected all of our, all of the required chemistry laboratory course manuals in our Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at, at, at Florida International University. And we collected all of our in-person laboratory manuals. We didn't want to look at the, the COVID situation at the time, and so we collected the, the last in-person manuals that they used. We then, uh, I should say he then used the 3D lap and some of the criteria from a prior publication uh, to code all of the experiments across all of these different courses. Uh, and two raters coded 20% of the data corpus until we reached agreement. Uh, and then we created what I call these footprints to show what, uh, which courses or which practices particular experiments are engaging in. And so I've divided the courses that we have into three rough groups. The first is what I call our introductory group. And so this, this, is, uh, this includes our general chemistry one and two labs. The next group, there's two particular uh, sets of courses here, analytical chemistry, or our introductory to quantitative analysis, as well as organic chemistry one and two. I've lumped these together as our next step courses, as they do not have to take these in any particular order. A lot of our students uh, will opt to take our analytical chemistry course alongside or before they take organic chemistry. And so this represents the next level of labs that they leave after they leave general chemistry. And then the last one is uh, a, a, an assortment of the upper division labs that we offer uh, at FIU, um, all of which have organic chemistry two lab as a prerequisite. So they can take those labs again in any order and in any sequence. Um, so we've collected physical chemistry one and two, biochemistry one. Uh, we do have biochemistry two, but it is not a required lab for our BS in chemistry degree, as well as our instrumental analysis or our second semester uh, analytical chemistry course. Um, and so Eddie went and coded all of the labs and made footprints, and I'm going to, they're very small, um, there's a lot of data here, but I want to see what you think. What do you see? What do you see? <laughs> a lot of white squares, <laughs> right? So can you tell where I've had some influence? <laughs> <laughs> so this represents the in most of the laboratory courses at, uh, at FIU. Um, and you can also see where I've had some influence or spheres of influence with particular instructors. I've had the most influence on general chemistry. I've been allowed to help transform most of the second semester of general chemistry, as well as some of the first semester general chemistry. And so you can clearly see my influence here. Um, the other influence I had is actually in our first semester analytical, right? There's an increase in practices. Um, but what we have here is a very vast, wide open white space, um, specifically in first and second semester organic chemistry, where the students are not doing a ton of engaging with the practices. Doesn't mean they're not doing chemistry, it just means that they're not engaging in these practices. And even in the more advanced courses, the ones that require organic and general chemistry to move on, our upper division, oftentimes taken as seniors, uh, we're not asking them to do a ton with their knowledge. 
And so when we do start to look at this in terms of number of practices that are engaged with, uh, and so what the circles are going to represent is the number of experiments that engage in a number of practices. So what we see, Our yes. Is just for, for those of us who aren't yes. Uh, so our first semester, our first semester organic chemistry lab right now focuses a lot on technique building. So they learn how to do recrystallization, distillation, separations. They learn about SN1 and SN2 reactions, but it's really just they follow a procedure and they get a percent yield. And they don't ask, they're not asked anything about why their percent yield is what it is or what could have gone wrong or what you would change. They're just asked to fill in a little bubble sheet, essentially, that says, here is my grams that I recovered. Here is the percent yield, and it goes to their TA. So it's essentially just in the lab test. Yes, okay. they're just in the lab. They're doing experiments with with mild success. Uh, some of them are not successful, um, but uh, they are. Their assessment in the course is not based on. It's based on completion. Not a lot of. Uh, not necessarily the thought that's in their lab reports, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah so, yeah, so to do this analysis, we collected the actual physical laboratory manuals that the students are given, and th some of them have the, the carbon copy sheets in the back. And so this is only what, again, it's only the laboratory manual. So it's only what the resource explicitly asks students to do. So we look at the pre-lab questions to see if they're asked to think about what might be going on. We look at the post-lab questions to look for those data analysis, like what do your data mean? What do your data tell you about the efficacy of your experiment? We also look at those procedural steps to see if there's any kind of building towards the practices while they're actually mixing chemicals. Um, and this is the result of that, uh, ex uh, using the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol to then uh, on the laboratory manuals. Um, so when we look at the distribution of practices in the experiments, uh, this is just another way to visualize that big, white, vast open space of the footprints. Um, what we see is that the bulk of experiments in organic chemistry uh, engage students in zero practices. Um, analytical and instrumental is a little bit better. Uh, we're getting some experiments. One experiment engages them in four practices. Um, but biochemistry is things, a uh, course that students usually take in their second or in their senior year, uh, maybe one, but oftentimes zero practices. Uh, and then in physical chemistry, again, very low on the practices. When we look at the practice that is, uh, the practices that are emphasized the most, happily, the one practice that if it is there that they do is anal analysis and interpretation of data. So the bright spot in all of this for us is that when we do ask them to do practices, it's asking them to think about their data. But it's not as often as we would hope, as evidenced by our, our footprints. And so me, my philosophical thought is that when we look at the distributions of practices and experiments across a progressive curriculum, this is what I would love to see, some sort of distribution like this, that we engage students and teach them how to do these ways of thinking very early in their laboratory experiences. And then as they get to be senior juniors and seniors, we take the training wheels off little by little as they get there. And at, by the time they get to physical chemistry or to biochemistry, they've got a much more, they've got a much more robust arsenal of tools and ways of thinking that we can do engage the students in more authentic research practices, uh, things like cures or, or even just senior level research. Um, so this is, this is my philosophical, like this is my opinion, so this is not actual data. Um, but in order to try and achieve this and to get some buy-in from the faculty members that I work with, I also had Eddie start to think about how can we revise these materials. So the wonderful thing about the 3D lap is that not only is it evaluative, but it is also um, 
you, you can also get some professional development out of it. Because the, it's, the criteria for the practices are very much like a checkbox, if you're looking at a laboratory experiment and you only need one more prompt in order to engage in a practice, that makes it very clear what you need to ask your students to do in order to engage in that practice. And so I had him, Eddie's uh, background is in analytical chemistry, so I asked him to take a look at uh, some of the analytical and instrumental chemistry labs just to see with small changes, how could we actually get these footprints to look different? And so one of the labs that the students do in analytical chemistry is an investigation of fertilizers. They're looking at the amount of phosphorus in commercially available miracle Grow. Um, and so this is a question that they're asked in their lab report. So they're asked for the calculated percent phosphorus in the fertilizer samples that they used. And that's where it ends. Um, however, if you, the way Eddie added to it, and he asked the students, what can you infer about the effectiveness in each fertilizer in delivering macronutrients based on your calculations? Um, and so making a simple change or following up and getting students to think about what does, this, what does this percent phosphorus mean in terms of plant growth? We're using this for fertilizer. Um, making small changes like this can actually get us some extra practices. Um, and so you can see we get at least uh, one experiment, one project that gets two extra practices and the last project gets another practice. And so making meaningful change does not necessarily require an entire revamp of a curriculum. I think it just takes careful thought about what, uh, what the students are being asked to do. Another example from our instrumental chemistry lab, uh, they, do where they do a lab where they look at the amount of aspirin in, um, in particular over-the-counter analgesics. And so they ask what compounds are present uh, that might interfere with aspirin determination. Uh, but that's all they're asked. And so to follow up, asking students why those compounds interfere with the ultraviolet absorption and using that structure feature, structural features to c support that claim, uh, we can make our instrumental chemistry class look a bit better in terms of the things we're asking students to do. But the caveat in all of this that uh, we've been working on is that engaging students in the scientific practices does not necessarily equate to them building those skills, right? We can lead them to the water, but we cannot make them drink the water or engage with the water or purify the water, whatever you're going to do to that water. Um, and so this has been the question uh, that I've had since I left as a postdoc, right? So we can get them to engage with it, but does it actually build their facility to do so? And to understand if they're building that capacity, we need to actually assess what they're doing in the laboratory. And so we've got, I mentioned some goals of the laboratory learning earlier. Uh, these are another smattering of goals of laboratory learning. So learning of science concepts, understanding of the practices, not necessarily the practices defined uh, by the NRC, but some, uh, some, there is some overlap, as well as general skills like teamwork, teamwork and team management. But the assessments of laboratory outcomes have been really focused on chemistry content knowledge, really looking again at that at the individual labs, the differences between inquiry and more cookbook labs. We've looked at student attitudes and perceptions, as well as building those general skills, critical thinking, which I don't love that term, uh, problem solving, and inquiry skills. And so just before I left for FIU, uh, myself and Melanie and Debbie Harrington uh, submitted a grant to NSF that was funded. And the goal of the project was to design assessment tasks that would start to characterize students' progression and proficiency with, with, uh, with the scientific practices. And so the goal was to design tasks that were in authentic chemistry context. They weren't biology. They weren't physics. They were chemistry. But they were not content dependent, or students' responses to these tasks were not content dependent, which means they could answer it without have doing, done, being, having done a particular experiment or have been familiar with a particular chemical phenomenon, but also that were aligned with the NGSS and the framework for K-12 science education. Lots of people had hands in making that those two documents very explicit and had done a lot of legwork for us. And so we wanted to make sure to honor that and make sure that our tasks were closely aligned uh, with, those, with those two documents. And so we had set forth to design tasks for four of the practices, just to, uh, and the four that we would most commonly find based on some of the data we had prior. And so we were looking for things like analyzing and interpreting data, constructing explanations, and engaging in argumentation. And so to design our assessment questions, we used a modified evidence-centered design framework. Um, 
And so in the evidence-centered design framework, we have our claim space, which is what we want students uh, to have and know, or sorry, what, we, what knowledge we want students to have and how you want them to know it. We have the evidence space, which is what evidence will we accept that a student has that, that particular knowledge, and how will you analyze and interpret that evidence. And then we also have the task space, which is what task will students perform to actually demonstrate that they have that knowledge. And so in order to look at our claim space, we use the key elements from the published national documents, from the framework and from the NGSS. And so we picked out, for example, one here, analyze data systematically to look for patterns or test whether data are consistent with an initial hypothesis. So when you look at this, this claim space, there's a lot here to unpack, right? And so if we were to try and assess this, this becomes problematic. What part of this statement do we start to focus on? So then we move to our evidence space where we crafted what we called evidence statements. So these are the much more accessible pieces of this, uh, this outcome or this goal. And so one of the evidence statements that we came up with was given data, we wanted students to generate a plot with axes and labels to illustrate patterns. This is something much more concrete that we can say, yes, the student can do this, or yes, the student needs, uh, needs more support in doing this. And then from all of these, we can create a set of related prompts that are, uh, that are clear to the student, and these are our actual tasks. And so I'm going to uh, show you a task today and talk to you a little bit about our process. Uh, and so I love this quote because it really highlights how important assessment is. And that is the power of assessment to reveal and support learning depends on how well students' responses to tasks actually or authentically reflect their thinking and understanding. Uh, and, I, and I know many of the graduate students in Melanie's group right now are living this quote. Um, any time that we create an assessment task or a homework question or a problem set for our students, we always have to keep this in the back of our mind. Are they not understanding it? Are they not responding in a particular way because they don't know? Or is it because the task that we have designed does not actually adequately get at what we're trying to get from our students? And so this is where my brain lives. And so when we, looked, when we started to look at the data that came from these tasks, we looked at the evidence statement. We also, as a group, as a team, we came up with target responses to our, to our actual assessment tasks to say, OK, this is what I would hope students would give us. We also pilot tested it in a number of different laboratory settings to get student responses and started to look at how they were responding. And from all of those, we, as a team, developed an assessment rubric uh, so that we could score or look at how far or the progression of students in terms of development of their scientific practices. And so the task I want to share with you today is about a theory of combustion known as phlogiston theory. Um, so this is what students are given. Again, trying to keep the con them content independent. All of the stuff they need, all, all of the content they need to be able to answer this question is provided in, the, in this little what we call preamble. And so it tells them what phlogiston theory is, uh, and it tells them that a group of students carry out an experiment to investigate what happens when you burn something in a crucible. And so the first question we ask them is more of a validation question. So we've just told them what phlogiston theory is. And then we ask them, OK, if phlogiston theory is true, what should happen to the mass of this stuff when it's burnt in air? And so they would select its mass will decrease. Uh, and then they selected a reasoning. And so these were forced responses. So these were multiple choice. After they think about what the theory would, would have said, then we give them the student data. And so we give them a data table uh, and ask them to show calculations to perform uh, on how to obtain evidence from this data about what happens to the mass of the combustible substance. And so they're given some uh, disconfirming evidence here about this particular theory. We've got lots of different calculations here in our data set, um, but most of them uh, knew what to subtract here. And then again, that, that the, where the meat comes in, right? So based on this data and your calculation, what actually happens to the mass? Does it support or re refute the phlogiston theory, and why? Uh, and so the basic framework we're working on here is that this explanation is supported by evidence that is based on their data or observation or measurement or findings from other studies that they're going to justify through this rationale. And that's kind of how this, this task is, 
is developed. And those are the three parts. And so to start out our first trial with this, we gave it to uh, 200 total students, 100 students that were in a general chemistry one classroom that taught using the chemistry, life, the universe, and everything, or CLUE curriculum. That is a research-based, uh, reformed general chemistry curriculum uh, developed also by Melanie Cooper and Mike Klimkowski um, that I'm quite uh, intimately familiar with. Um, and this, uh, the important part about this curriculum and why we gave it to CLUE students is because CLUE is a curriculum that is designed uh, on how and why things occur and chemical phenomena occur. So in class, in lecture, in assessments, there is a lot of engaging with the practices, specifically the practice of argumentation. Always in CLUE, the students are asked why things happen and asked to justify their reasoning. Uh, this was also given to 100 students in a general chemistry 2 class, but was a more traditional math-based, calculation-based uh, course. And this is at a small, and uh, is at a large research university uh, in the southeastern United States. Uh, once we collected this data, we looked at all of the uh, student responses, and we scored them on the rubric we developed. Uh, we, five raters scored independently and came to agreement of uh, about 0.86 to 1.0 on the different responses. And so I want to look at the last bit, uh, which is the reasoning portion about their calculations supporting or refuting the phlogiston theory. And so this is the rubric that the team came up with. And so we characterized students' responses into three levels. One that was le uh, level zero, which is the illogical or incoherent or inconsistent uh, reasoning. Level one is partially coherent so that the reasoning connects to the evidence or the theory and is consistent with the initial claim that they had made. And then level two is the highest level of reasoning. They're connecting all of the pieces together, uh, both the evidence and the theory, and was consistent with their original claim. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the scoring rubric. And when, we and when we looked at the differences in levels between our CLU students and our traditional students, we started to see a trend that most of our traditional students were either level zero or one or giving us level zero or one explanations, whereas a bulk of the CLU students were giving us level one or level two responses. And so being the good statistician that I am, I ran a chi-squared analysis and found that this is actually a statistically significant difference. So students that are engaging with scientific practices on a day-to-day -day basis are actually better able to reason through and connect and have coherent reasoning and understanding. But the problem was, upon trying to replicate the results at full scale, uh, about 2,500 responses, we couldn't. Uh, and so we then, looked at what the institutions were looking at. We, again, so we were looking at the institutions we used. Institution one had two different types of lecture and two different types of laboratory curricula. So lots of not controlling of variables. Um, however, institution two uh, had all clue lectures and had a laboratory curriculum that was all project based. And so we have very different, uh, different institution types here and we were hoping that we would see that institution two would have higher rubric scores, um, but alas, we did not. Uh, and so we tried to think, okay, is it the context that's wrong? So we had 233 students take uh, this, this phlogiston task. We also created a parallel task that was about the, con the concept of effusion of gases. Um, and so we thought, okay, so phlogiston is antiquated, nobody teaches it, so of course the students don't know. But a fusion is a much more authentic chemistry task and is taught in many general chemistry courses. And so we started to think, let's see if giving them an authentic context would help their rubric, uh, help their reasoning. Uh, and so what we see is that we do have a little bit of a decrease in level zero responses from those students who engaged with the task that was in an authentic science context. Um, however, or I should say, Happily, there is a significant difference here, right? So our phlogiston task and our original goal of having things be content agnostic or it uh, was not the best idea. Um, and so we tried to do this again um, to see if we could actually look at the same prompts, just use an actual combustion reaction. So instead of just some magical, mystical substance that burns, 
we are actually looking at the, the combustion of magnesium. And so we gave this to 700 and 1,725 total participants, um, broken down from first and second semester labs. Uh, and so we took a sampling of these uh, that are roughly equal. So one that is, again, it's the same prompts, just one focused on uh, phlogiston task, which is more theoretical, and one that's more grounded in actual uh, chemistry. And what we find with our first semester students is that we have a, we see a larger blue bar in that level two responses. So students that were given the magnesium task had a higher occurrence of these level two coherent, cogent uh, reasoning patterns. Um, and happily again, this is a statistically significant difference. So what this told us is that on the outset, our goal, or I should say my goal, of having them be content agnostic might not have been the best idea. And so, uh, to conclude, what do we find is that students are often mo given most of the opportunities to engage in the practices early in their chemistry major, but not so much after they leave uh, their introductory courses. Small but meaningful changes, however, can be made to help increase the engagement in those practices. Assessment of what your laboratory outcomes are is crucial. As you can see, assessment is, is, is a, t a beast that needs to be tamed. Uh, and it, we're still trying to figure out how we can best assess the laboratory. Um, but the, the point there is that we're, uh, we're fervently trying. Um, and we've learned that assessments need to be in a relevant context and focus not just on practices, uh, but also on the core ideas of the discipline. So the ongoing work from that uh, across the board, uh, this is my newest graduate student, Trent Keeler, uh, and he's actually starting to work on developing project-based organic laboratory curriculum materials um, to start to hope and change students' uh, goals towards just getting out of lab as fast as possible. We're not sure if it's a utility value or if it's just, uh, we're not sure what it is, but we think it might be something with utility value. Giving them something to actually engage with, making organic more interesting, more, uh, more related to real world context, we're hoping to see that there's a change there. We're not sure, we haven't collected any data yet. But in terms of developing those assessment questions, uh, myself, my former postdoc on the project, as well as a former postdoc from the Cooper Group, Elizabeth Day, uh, we have just submitted in July uh, another grant to NSF uh, to develop these now three-dimensional assessment tasks for the lab that are not just focused on practices, but are looking to engage students in both the practices and certainly the core ideas. And with that, I would love to thank the project team that has helped me to start to become an independent researcher. Uh, of course, Melanie Cooper, Debbie Harrington at Grand Valley, who's the other co-PI on the project, Norda Stevenson and Erin Duffy, who worked on the project. Norda was my postdoc at FIU and is now in a faculty position of her own at Western Washington University. Uh, Liz Day, who is at now at UT El Paso, uh, as well as Kira Padilla, who is at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, um, as she was an uh, international scholar exchange for a semester and helped work on this project. Of course, the student participants who out, who, without whom I would not have any data, FIU and the NSF for funding, uh, and of course, you for your attention. So with that, I will take questions. So this is a discussion. Uh, the folks that are involved in the three-dimensional learning project are giggling. Um, so in turn, we've discussed the differences between explanation and argumentation ad nauseum for probably the last five years. Um, and whether they actually appear differently. Yeah, Danny's going like this. So it's been longer. Um, and yeah, 10 years, right? So what really is the difference? And what we started to land on is that Students are often, we, we landed on the fact that argument is about something where the answer is not directly known, right? So I think of, in, for organic chemistry, I think of NMR spectra. If you're given a spectra and you're trying to figure out the structure of a compound, you don't necessarily know what the structure of that compound is, and that would be considered argumentation. But explanation, if I ask a student which of these has the higher boiling point, I know the answer to that. Right, so we landed on the fact that when we do assessments, however, again, the 3D lab was looking for assessments. Um, oftentimes, these two terms are conflated. They're conflated in the literature a lot. And so for ease, 
we, we combined them. But in some aspects, especially organic lab, I, I, we might have to separate them. <laughs> Yes, I can certainly repeat the questions. My apologies. Yes, David. I have two questions. So one is a very selfish question. Okay. Okay. So I'm teaching the doctoral seminar on science ed, and it happens to be the 10th anniversary of the K-12 pregnancy medical students. Yes, it does. Yes. So for those on Zoom, David's question was, why do we use the framework for K-12 in a higher ed space? Um, and I, so I deal a lot with freshmen, because I teach general chemistry. And you cannot tell me that a student in a freshman year of college is different <laughs> from a student in a senior level of high school. But also, we've looked at these documents that were put out for K-12. And we've looked at the, the benchmarks of where students should be with regard to particular practices by grade 12. And we look at our students and say, they're not there yet. And so yes, this document is for K-12. But when we have students that are in our general, organic, general or organic chemistry classes that are performing at the eighth grade band, this means that it's not just a K-12 issue or a K-12 problem. And so we, you know, we're getting students from high school. Um, and we also have students who have been brought up in NGSS land. Florida is not NGSS, but we have the next generation sunshine science standards, which look an awful lot like the NGSS. And so and it also help, we've also been of the thought that if they're learning this in high school and this is the way they're learning science, we can also use what the, the foundations that, the, that K-12 has set to then build on that and hopefully get them to move above or, or hit that 12th grade band. So we have the Michigan science standards, which are the NGSS plus the Great Lakes. OK. Uh, so, for Zoomland, David's question is about uh, the, I guess, the, the struggle between con uh, having an authentic science context or an authentic science practice, but also, sorry, say it again. Somebody values correctness. Right, so, ah, yes, the value of correctness. Um, I would say that we need to shift away from this valuing of correctness, because if, in lab, right, students are in lab for a finite amount of time. No matter how much they like to like, keep doing their experiments after the TAs tell them to clean up, they're going to just be done. They have to stop at some point. And honestly, to me, the one correct answer uh, is, is a very one-track view of actual science. Um, a lot of the things that we pose to them, though, have one correct answer. And I, so I think that's a little bit on us as the, uh, as the uh, tour guides through science for our students, that we need to be giving a more accurate representation of the philosophy of science and what that means in terms of correct answers and what is actually correct. I'm getting too philosophical. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I was happy when you said at the end you're going to do the mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you got pushback at the beginning of saying we're just going to focus on practice and not on mm -hmm. the other pieces when we're saying is that yes, that mm -hmm. kind of spoke. So the question is about the fact that I, we originally proposed to make content agnostic or content independent uh, assessment tasks, but our, our framework is three dimensional learning, which is intertwining knowledge and practices. Um, to answer your question, we got no pushback. <laughs> NSF funded us. <laughs> NSF said, yes, go do this. And, we pro and we've thought about, and Melanie and I have actually said these words to one another, we should have known, right? We have this theory of learning that says they need to be intertwined. And it's actually nice that our experimental data has shown us that that actually does need to happen, in, especially in our chemistry labs, and especially when it comes to what we're asking our students to do. Um, so we did not get any pushback. But it, we, it, it is research, right? And research doesn't always work right the first time you do it. And so that's why we are moving forward, really emphasizing content and, and the practices, as well as sprinkling in some core ideas or cross-cutting concepts as we can. Right, so the question from the audience is more how can we support K-12 in moving and in, in supporting this work or how can our support, our, how can our work support what's being done in K-12? Um, to me, I think I, I've looked at the AP labs and they're very much like do this procedure and write up this lab report. And, um, and that's supposed to be, you know, our, our best and brightest, right? The AP curriculum is, is the pinnacle. It's the hardest, quote unquote. Um, and so if that, is, if that is the standard we're holding students to and it's all rote, if it's all memorization and it's all the rigor is, ga is gained through more complex calculations, that like what is, that's a message that we're sending that that's what chemistry is. That's what it means to be a chemist, which is my other talk, uh, which is a whole vein of research. Um, but to me, it's giving structure for students to explore safely, right? We're not going to have students putting sodium in a, in a, in a beaker of water. It's dangerous. But there are ways in which we can construct through guided inquiry or structured inquiry that allow the students to explore and, and foster that scientific thought, but in a more controlled environment in, in a high school. And that m can be done in a block schedule that is 40 or 80 minutes, depending on the school district. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I know that um, one of our, one of my colleagues who was a postdoc, also Ryan Stowe, uh, has written an entire, has worked with high school teachers to look at a clue curriculum that emphasizes the practices and core ideas, uh, but also at a high, for a high school level or a much more K-12, not necessarily elementary school, but certainly for high school. Uh, he's worked with a number of folks trying to work on a high school clue curriculum. Mm hmm Claire. Um, so you mentioned that you are focused on four practices mm -hmm. uh, in this work. I'm curious why you chose those four mm -hmm. as a starting point. So, tho so the question was, why did I choose those four practices? And we chose those four practices because when we thought about laboratory curricula nationally, if they're going to engage in a practice, and it came from our own looking at a more traditional curriculum. And if a, if a more traditional curriculum or something less project-based or less open-ended was, was engaging in practices, 
it was one of those four. So in analyzing, interpreting data, or constructing an explanation. And so that was really for the buy-in for like the future end users of our assessment tasks. And so if we had said something uh, about designing solutions, people might say, oh, I don't, I don't teach the chemical engineers. Why are we teaching engineering? And so we wanted to be able to assess uh, the practices that are most common or typical, even in a more traditional or uh, less open-ended curriculum. Gotcha. And then you mentioned that you're dabbling in cross-cutting concepts. So I was wondering how and which of those? Uh, so the question, yeah. So the question is, which cross-cutting concepts are we dabbling in? Uh, we have not made a decision. And I only say dabble in cross-cutting concepts because the cross-cutting <laughs> concepts are, are weird. Um, and even as the 3DL community, the folks that are in this room that I meet with on a weekly basis, uh, the cross-cutting concepts are not all the same. So we have cross-cutting concepts like structure function and structure property relationships, but also cons cause and effect, which those are great. Those cut across, and those are very easy to see why they're cross-cutting concepts. But then we have cross-cutting concept that is called energy. <laughs> what is energy, right? And so there's not a lot. So some of them are a lot e were a lot easier for us to delineate from others. And so they're at different scales. So some focus on there is one uh, cross-cutting concept of scale of how things look at the macro and the micro scale, um, but they're all of just different grain sizes, and they some of them don't apply to every situation that we do. So that's why we're dabbling and not like jumping in with both feet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, this maybe kind of goes back a little bit to the question about like the content or yeah, content independent or content independent questions. Um, so like one thing that I think about is whether it's possible and whether it's important to assess like the practices and the content separately. Like on some level, I feel mm. like So the question was, is it possible and should we be assessing content and practices independently? Or, and if it is possible, when? Um, and so one of the things that, that we have discussed at length in, this, in, in our 3DL group is that not all things need to be three-dimensional. And not all things can be three-dimensional, because if everything you ask the students to do has a practice, a core idea, and a cross-cutting concept, they take a lot of mental effort. You're connecting. You're drawing all these connections. If you gave a student a multiple choice exam or a constructed response exam that was 20 questions that were all three-dimensional, your students would revolt because they wouldn't be able to finish, or it would require so much brain power that they would just crawl out of the room. Right? And so we've, we, we advocate for a balance of these things. But the practices require that you know something. So oftentimes, you can write assessment questions that are like, which of these is the correct Lewis structure of methane? You need to know how to do that, because if then I ask, OK, between methane and looking at the Lewis structures of methane and acetone, which of these has the higher boiling point and why? If you don't know how to draw the Lewis structures of those things or interpret the Lewis structures of those things, you can't do any of those higher order thinking skills. You can't engage in the three-dimensional learning. And so a lot of that, we have talked about it. We use the term skills. You do, there are a set of skills that students need to be able to know how to do in order to be able to then do the three-dimensional learning. Did that answer your question? OK. Yes. So Zoom land, the question was, how do we negotiate the content difference uh, and alignment between lecture and lab? So 
when I was a postdoc here at, F uh, at MSU, I was shocked to learn that lab and lecture are decoupled. So, and oftentimes our students just based on space constraints, we're taking second semester general chemistry lecture, but first semester general chemistry lab. And some were taking it concurrently. They were able to get their schedules to line up, and so they were taking first semester lecture and lab together. But that was not always the case. And so we had to think of a way that did not rely necessarily on the content being presented in lecture. And so our laboratory experiences were designed to build on the skills that we would have and that the students would have, either from prior science instruction or that we would build through the laboratory course just as the semester progressed. Um, now, at FIU, they are linked. They are required as co-requisites but the content is still not the same. <laughs> um, and I think it's just the lab and lecture instructors need to talk to one another, but also if you start with things like atomic theory, we're not going to be making cathode ray tubes in the general chemistry lab for them to discover that the atoms have electrons, right? So there's, it, there, it depends on what content and how tightly you want that alignment to be. Um, it's a question that we get all of the time and that is a conundrum for all of the folks that study lab. Should they be connected to lectures? Should they, you know, should they be do directly one-to-one -one related? I, I don't have a great answer for that, unfortunately. Yes. Yes. All right. Oh, absolutely. There's no evidence that linking them, unlinking them has any effect on their perf Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're teaching 5,000 students at a time. Think about this. Mm -hmm. uh, an, in an inquiry lab on Monday is not an inquiry lab on Friday, or the <laughs> students um, are taking time practice. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's a very different beast. Mm -hmm. Just sorry. It's okay. So, yeah, I, I, I want two questions. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll answer the first question first, was what is the effect of motivation, or what is the student's motivation to continue? Um, we have not specifically looked at that, at motivation uh, as of yet. Uh, my research group, the other half of my research group that doesn't do lab reform research, looks at students' chemistry identity. And so we're, my hypothesis is that giving students a more authentic view of what science is, that it's not just following directions, may actually help us to have students who are not terrified to take chemistry or might actually feel like they could be a part of that chemistry community. And so while we're not looking at motivation, uh, I will say that the motivation for many of my students in my class is because they're pre-meds and it's required. Um, and so, but also that's what my, my one graduate student who's looking at organic lab reform um, is trying to look at, right? Can we, is it a utility value problem? Is it expectancy value theory? What is it? Like why, because we know that students' goals in lab often is to just get out, get in, get out, and get be done as quickly as possible. Uh, and they always get upset. They used to get upset when we kept them for the two, full two and a half hours because they used to be able to do the experiments here in about 45 minutes. They would get in and get out and get their product and be done. And so how do we shift that that mentality from this is the goal, right? Your goal is to just investigate as opposed to your goal is to get the right answer. Um, the second question, I'm, I knew I was gonna forget it. Uh, <laughs> 
Yes, the inquiry. So what are the, when I say less degrees of freedom, what does that mean? Um, so yes, that is a degree of freedom, right? Letting students choose their glassware. Um, but what I mean by degrees of freedom is how how structured is it? So can students choose the question that they're actually set to investigate? That is one degree of freedom. So for the, the project-based labs, they're all s investigating the same question. Now, another degree of freedom that they could potentially have is, what is the procedure? Is that given to them, or is that something that the design, they're designing on their own? And so in the project-based labs, they have that freedom. They're limited by the types of materials they're given, but within that safe space that we know that is, not going, that is going to be rather innocuous, it's, it's going to be safe. They can have room to make their own procedures. Um, and then the third, another degree of freedom is how do you present your findings? Um, and so one of the things that we've done in the project-based curricula that I've worked with is we've given students the opportunity to do more than just write a lab report. And I think all of the TAs appreciate not just grading another lab report after every week of an experiment or after every, you know, after every project. And so giving students the opportunity to present science as scientists present science in a poster, in a talk, like we give the students those opportunities so that they can see, yeah, it's not just writing a lab report that's 15 pages long the day before it's due. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, their comments were, you guys are not keeping us out though from the science area. They were taught just the vocabulary, those routines, and uh, the correct answers, and mostly the tests. So there was that tension, what are we actually doing, what they were told, what they know that happens in the science and the lab areas, and what's happening in science extension. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, one, I'm glad you're doing the work in making the tea, mm -hmm. but I realize that professors in those, uh, in the sciences, mm -hmm. area were not really keeping us how to do the work they were asking them to engage in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question from the audience was, uh, what, am I, what is my interaction with K-12 teachers? How are we teaching the K-12 teachers to teach, like, how are we preparing them to go teach the students, like, in this fashion? Um, I do not personally have interface with the pre-service teachers. How are you professors teaching? Oh, how are our professors? So it, de it depends on the professors. Um, the ones that I have influence over that will listen to me uh, when I tell them that their students are not getting much out of their laboratory experiences. Um, I've been able to like pull them along, but it's taken me five to six years to build that relationship and start to show them, like, here's what your students can actually do. Um, and so a lot of it is PR, right? Because I, and I meet the professors where they are. I ask the professors, what goals do you have for your students? For example, the conversation I need to have with my graduate student and our organic lab director literally on Friday is, what are your goals for your students as they leave organic chemistry lab? Because we have our goals as researchers, the pie in the sky, we want students to engage in inquiry and we want all of this and we want practices. But I also need buy-in from the organic laboratory director who is potentially going to let us use the organic labs in order to do this research. And so I want to create a product uh, that is amenable to both us, the researchers, as well as the person who's using it. And so I've been doing a lot of work with, in terms of buy-in with my laboratory directors and laboratory coordinators to try and have that conversation so that it's not just 
I know what's best to do this because I, I know the research says it's better, but trying to show them here are your goals and here's how we can maybe take that past that or show how their goals aren't necessarily being met with evidence from their students. Mm -hmm. In that area itself, I think conversation is happening, not that they should be demonstrated. Right, and, and I will say that at least at my institution, they're happening. Some of them are happening simultaneously. Some of them are moving at different speeds than others. As you saw from that big graphic, right? I've had a lot of influence in general chemistry. Um, we've had, I, and it's just because of you know, uh, proximity, right? My office is close to the other general chemistry lab faculty that teach general chemistry. And so I, I see them on a much more regular basis, whereas the organic lab faculty person is, is, <laughs> is six doors down. So it's not far, um, <laughs> but it's just, it really is just proximity um, and so and it's also and it's also readiness right so we just are leaving a, a pandemic but we also currently at FIU do not have any instructional labs because of an HVAC renovation it has nothing to do with us that has nothing to do with the curriculum we have not had general chemistry lab facilities for 18 months so we have we have had to go online and so what we're doing is trying to create experiences for the students that are still getting at something science-y that is not just clicking buttons in, in virtual labs, what can we have them do that still emphasizes what it is to do science? And so some of it is paused because I need, we need physical lab spaces in order to do some of these projects. But uh, a lot of it, there's so many moving pieces. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me let me mm -hmm. here again. So maybe this is time for dialogue. Mm -hmm. We should be our we science professors should be coming over to to learn how to do things. And it is time for dialogue between both of us, right? And, and I, I don't think it's a very good I don't think it's going to be very productive for uh, people in the college of exercise. Okay, all the science professors must come over here to <laughs> And and I, I will say that I think that there's there's a um, you know we all have to, we all have things mm -hmm. to learn and, I, and and that's what's what's great about creative theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think I I, uh, I I'm gonna call I'm gonna call it time now. If that's okay, that, that is one hundred percent fine. Thank you, everyone. I have a oh. for you. Well, thank you. There you go. Thank you. And Do you I have one more thing to say. OK. Um, which is, the next speaker will be uh, Troy Sadler from the University of North Carolina on the 19th of October. So thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be back. Thank you. Hello. Oh, you're not. Never mind.